Guys, today I'm going to review uh, one of the students who sent me some footage of him playing ML50. So I appreciate him sending that. So we're just going to look through the footage, see where he he can improve, you know, see how to improve in general ML50. Like, so, you know, some tips and tricks on how to beat the player pool, because these games are not as tough, uh, soft as they were 10 years ago, but they were st they are still quite soft. So there's plenty of money to be made if you have a good approach. So we've got king four, which is, very, is a very easy fold. Your hand is dominated, disconnected, paying high rake, and the same with queen nine. Those hands are nowhere near your calls. So queen seven offsuit, it would be a bit too light of an open, but if you believe that your opponent is quite weak, as in he overfolds, he doesn't three bet, he's just very nitty and you know weak post flop, you can potentially open this, but it's definitely not a standard open raise. And the same goes with a hand like ace three. It's close. It's you know, and normally it's a close fold, but if you believe that your opponent is a bit on the weak side, then opening a bit more often makes sense. And we get so this guy is tagged blue. Okay, so let's see. He's playing 2017. It looks like so. This you know, I assume 2.5 is the three bet. Let me see. Um. Probably not actually. Anyway, so this guy's play, playing 2017, so you can expect this guy to be a bit tighter, right? So it does make sense that this hand then gets opened. Uh, King Queen Four uh, with three diamonds is a pretty good board for you. Uh, now remember, he's been a bit tight pre-flop, right? So it's not like he's going to have too many really, you know, garbage hands like eight six offsuit, let's say. So you're gonna have to fight to win this pot. With Ace Three betting, you know, makes a decent amount of sense. Thinking like. You have a do not flush draw. You also unblock all of his air. So I'd like to usually see that here. This is a, this is a nice board to mix it up on. I think betting range here is a little bit aggressive. Checking range is obviously, you know, I've, I've had students ask, do you ever want to check range and position? And that doesn't really happen much, to be honest. In a three and four bet pot, that can happen. But in a single race pot, that's uh, that's quite rare. So in a, in a normal button, big one spot, that's uh, that's quite rare. So let's say you take a hand like board like 10, 8, 6, monotone, right? That's obviously not a very good board for you, but it's not a board we want to range check on. We just want to be more careful. So mostly want to, want to, want to see you bet here raise 3. And we get a queen, on, queen 9 deuce flop. Uh, this guy doesn't have a full stack, so he could be a recreational player. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I want to open this hand, but if you believe he's, uh, as I said, on the weaker side, then that's okay. Um, Queens, so on this board, we likely have to mix as well, so I wouldn't hate if you ended up checking here sometimes, having like a pretty weak queen. If you believe this guy is like just quite passive, but on the callie side, just betting makes a lot of sense. But if he's more on the aggressive side, you know, you have to add some more good hands to your checks. <clears throat> and with ace three we turn the nuts which is great so we should bet the bet size could even be a bit smaller if you like or a bit bigger but i do like the fact that we bet and facing this three and a half big blind bet with queen seven i mean especially at 40 big blinds we just get to rip it like we just get to check raise and get it in a decent amount of the time as in we check raise we don't have to rip it for 40 right away right but we get to be quite aggressive but queen seven is just a nice hand to call with you do a good job of unblocking his air, like jack 10 and jack 9, jack 8, that type of stuff. Uh, you're opening 2.5x from every position. I would like to see you open a little bit smaller from the earlier positions, although it's not a huge deal. If anything, I would say uh, at, at I would, yeah, I would say a smaller, a smaller size it makes a bit more sense. And so the river is a 10, which is a decent card for both of you. You know, villain could have easily checked back like jack ten, jack eight, king jack, and now hit a pair of straight. Uh, he could have he could have end like queen nine or ten nine. So we could end up going for a block bet here. Uh, we basically have media a lot of medium strength hands here, so we also should be doing that with the nuts sometimes, right? Be a bit tricky, but I think going for a block bet makes sense, especially against somebody, uh, especially against a potential recreational player. You know, they tend to not fold very much. They tend to not. Um, they tend to not like go for crazy bluff raises, right? And if this hand, if this hand gets raised, it's in a shitty spot because we've got one pair, which is okay, but we don't have any straight blockers. That sucks, right? So we won't want to get raised. 
Um, in theory, betting small here is the best play. If you size up to half pot exploitatively, I don't hate that. And he quickly folds, which is interesting, right? Like, what does he quickly fold with on that river? A7 will be a call against 2.2. And we're just in trouble on this board. We're in pretty big trouble. We will have Jack-10 here quite often. We'll have some as like, you know, King-Queen, etc. Ace-Jack. So with A7, this is one of those call once hands, perhaps call turn, uh, but, you know, probably not calling three streets. And I would say against nittier opponents, you can probably end up uh, just folding the turn against a big bet. Now on the flop, he checks behind, so he's saying, "Hey, I've got a, you know, I've got a decent hand. I don't want to bet, but my hand is, you know, my hand is probably something like Queen Jack, King Jack, Ace Five, that type of stuff." And sometimes he's going to be trapping, of course, but he's also just going to have hands like uh, Eight Six of Hearts, right? Just hands that have absolutely no equity. So this is a spot in which you want to be careful. He's he's representing his, uh, quite a few good hands, so you cannot just leave third pot for a you know at a very high frequency and expect to have a lot of success. So with like a weaker ace, I probably would like to see you check uh, here most of the time. <clears throat> uh, with king eight, so villain leads here. This is kind of awkward. I mean, we have a gut shot. We have one over card. Um, so when put in leads half pot, I mean, had he led something like five bucks or five blinds, I would have just folded. Um, against half pot, I think it's a barely winning call. When he leads into you on a board like this, which hits him pretty well, he probably has something, right? Probably has something. And we have so many hands to defend with. So I don't mind the call, but it's it's close. I, I do like it. And against half pot, it really just looks like as hand like queen jack, and he's just trying to milk you. So I would just fold. I think, I mean, we still have hands like queen 10 and king 10, and obviously all the value hands, right? We still have bigger heart draws, but just having a gut shot here, which is not even to the nuts, uh, this is just a fold. I also don't think he's pure bluffing very often, right? Other than like a pretty good hand like queen 10. So I'd like to see you just fold. And with a7 here, once villain checks behind again, you have to think you have the best hand almost always. Villain could have hit two pair on the four or a set. Uh, maybe he checked behind a8, a9 sometimes, but other than that, I mean, if he's very tricky, he might have hand like aces and check back twice sometimes. But I don't expect the average hand on 50 player to uh, to be pulling off a move like that. So I would, I would probably like to see you get value here with a7. And obviously a, a gigantic bet uh, is not necessary. We're representing mostly, uh, you know, pretty good but not great hands. So we don't need to go five times the pot. At least definitely not with this hand. Uh, I probably would have liked to see a value bet there. And it's very important that you now look what he's got, right? I mean, he when he snap checks behind, he probably had a hand like jacks or queen queen eight, something like that. But make sure to always check, guys. If, if they give you free information, I mean, why not take it, right? Maybe you learn something. Maybe he just snap checked back with like, seven high and you're like okay this guy doesn't bluff anything like that right so okay he's a bit on the nittier side just get some information from this guy uh 843 is a better board for the big blind than for you but it's still quite dry right so not much happening so we can still be quite aggressive here the eight is much better for him the four and a three you know don't matter too much there's some draws out there that both of you will have but it's kind of a blank board 9-6 would definitely be to lose. Queen-7 I didn't hate. That 9-6 uh, would be to lose. <clears throat> so we get this ace turn, which is incredible, of course. We can expect 5-deuce to be folding preflop or check-raising a decent amount. Um, he should have it sometimes, but who knows. And then ace-8 would sometimes get check-raised on the flop. 4s and 3s often get check-raised on the flop. So we have the best hand virtually always uh, now he will have an ace quite often here as well so it's not like you can go absolutely crazy right because against third pot he's going to call with ace high very very often on the flop with ace four specifically i'd love, definitely like to see you bet here and with king queen i'd sometimes like to see a bluff three bet not always Right, you can't just always do this with these types of hands, but sometimes I, I definitely like it. 
Um, one thing that worries me is that this player is playing 17-14, right? So, guys, if you see people who play that tight, you just can't be too aggressive against them. Normal players might be opening something like 20% in a middle position, maybe 22, right? But this guy might just be opening like 16%. So we don't have the same equity that we do against a regular opponent. So you have to be a bit more careful. You cannot, cannot expect as many folds. You can expect to get four bet quite a bit. So you have to be careful. Now with on ace, ace jack nine, this is a pretty good board for you. Um, some people, I mean, I imagine you're going to range one third. That's not the strategy I would use, but I would understand it. So let's see what happens. Call. Wow, what a river on ace four. So one he check raise, villain check raise, as I said. I mean, we've, we've counted the hands that were beat by, right? Threes, fours, ace, eight, five deuce, but we know that he wouldn't have played any of those hands in this manner very often. So um, there's just not, I mean, there's just only a low chance we're behind. Now, don't say he cannot have fours and threes. He can. He can have eights. He can have five deuce. It's just not that likely. So, and now, I mean, we don't really care what he does. We're going to make sure we're all, we're all in. If he bets small, we shove. If he bets big, we shove. <laughs> but of course, he has to spoil the party and check. So when he now checks, I mean, this is kind of strange. So I think he's often just giving up with a bluff, right? He might have just had like six, seven of diamonds and he was bluffing. So it's also not that easy for us to bluff. I wouldn't mind if you just put in a small bet here. Maybe trick him into check raising you thinking you're weak, right? And if he's like, if he's got nothing, you don't need a bet big to fold. It's also not that difficult to find air in your range, right? You'll have some hands like, you'll have some hands like, for instance, five, six of diamonds. You'll have maybe some kind of bigger flush draw. Uh, maybe you fuck you float him sometimes with king queen or something, but unlikely. So I'd like to see that small. Yeah, I mean, I understand why you're range betting here or betting one third, but uh, you cannot be too aggressive against guys like these who are super tight, right? And here, yes, I understand that you're shoving because you got the nuts. But as you saw by the snap by the snap fold, he was most likely just bluffing. So, yeah, be careful there. I mean, I don't think you're bluffing enough. <laughs> and this is funny because I see something that I used to do. I mean, this what the, if you look at that all that text that looks like it was written by Bill Gates when he was developing Microsoft. Um, let's be honest, when you if you, let's say you're in a spot, let's say he shoves all in on this river, right? You don't have ace four, you got like, whatever, ace five, right? You have, you have an okay hand, it makes some sense to call, it makes some sense to fold, and uh, you're deciding what to do. You're not gonna read all of this text, right? You, you're not. So you should be shortening your notes and just making them very simple, just to the point. Whereas now, I mean, fuck, uh, checks, bet, 75, whatever, like, uh, I mean, it's very hard to decipher this. So yeah, you have to make you have to simplify your notes a little bit, or oh, actually not, not a little bit, by by quite a bit. So that's uh, definitely something I would recommend. And with king queen, let's see. I mean, your hand selection is all right. I mean, we do we do a great job blocking. Um, we do a great job blocking his king, his queen, I guess. So I understand, but guys, be careful, right? If if somebody's super nitty and they call a three bet out of position, MP versus cut a button. Their range is pretty strong, so just blindly range betting everywhere doesn't make as much sense. Now, if this guy is just playing every hand, of course, you can be much more aggressive. So pay, pay attention to that. That's a little bit more of an advanced tip that I actually don't want to give, didn't want to give away, but um, yeah, pay attention to that. Be careful. Let's look at some questions. Why are a lot of top regs using small c-bets on flops? Well, sometimes it makes sense, 6-4 diamonds, and sometimes it's just a mistake. I mean, a lot of people might have done a lot of work, um, you know, like on their game, like three, four years ago, they haven't really done much work, and they, they still use those uh, strategies. Not everybody plays perfectly. I mean, nobody plays perfectly, in fact. What means bluff equity and how is the stat calculated? Uh, I don't like those stats, Ogmok, so uh, forget about them. Anyone know how to adjust the bet boxes on the stars helper? That's something we're gonna have to add, ask in the chat, uh, Willie. 
Yeah, um, this bluff equity is based on, uh, you know, faux pseudo GTO nonsense principles. So forget about that. It's based on uh, outdated uh, information. That one I'm not going to explain for sure. But uh, yeah, that, that's based on, uh, on nonsense. You'll never read those notes. Yeah. What's up, Jokta? We've played a few times. Yeah, those notes are very hard to read, right? So keep them simple. What's up, Muggy? When will your webinar be for the web, uh, for the uh, Lab Plus? I have support on the thirtieth, uh, Sabino. The reason why I haven't had a response yet is because we don't we didn't know yet. But yesterday we decided that it would be on the thirtieth, and so every month it will be somewhere in the last week in the month, right? So yeah. Uh, 30th of um, June, so in 11 days. And uh, as I was telling uh, Sig the Joker earlier, so uh, I'm gonna, not going to reveal the topic yet, but you guys will see. Uh, we'll be asking you for some hand histories, right? So that you also, I mean, so it's also like more personalized. So we're going to cover a certain topic. I'm going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation on that topic. I'm going to explain different principles about the topic. Um, you know, we're also do, going to do a little quiz. I'm going to do hand reviews to show, show, I mean, not just how to do things in Pi, but how to apply it to a real situation. Of course, I'm not just going to talk about theory, but also practice, right? How to exploit people. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, like a PowerPoint with a quiz, with a Q&A, with hands and everything. And it's going to, it's most likely going to be a two hour session. Uh, when you check on the forum, in the forum, uh, probably today or tomorrow, we're going to be asking you for those hands and you'll uh, be able to send one in. So stay tuned there, but it will be for sure, it will for sure be on the 30th, Sabino. Thanks for subscribing. Do I use CRV? <laughs> uh, when I first saw that program, I was like, fuck this, fuck this shit, I'd rather be bad. Uh, so I, I bought it, I got like two coaching sessions for it, but then I never used it again. I mean, one of the reasons why people have gotten a lot better is because Pio and all those other programs are easy to use, right? Like, I mean, not every, like, with a little bit of coaching, you can use it very well. Whereas the CREV, fuck, it looks so difficult. So it's very intimidating. So no, I've never really used it. If you're playing NL200 right now, do you think you should you could have a 30 buy and downswing? Oh yeah, sure. Definitely possible. Isn't bluff equity based on full to C bet? I've never looked up that, uh, I've never looked that up. I mean, I I know what the math will look like, but uh, I've never used that stat. I, will, I would actually not. I'm not just indifferent. I would actively encourage you not to use it, because it is based on a principle in GTO which is false, right? So basically, you're trying to accomplish something which is inherently false anyway. So there's no point. Just forget about it. If somebody asks you, hey, do it, just say no. Don't do it. If we're playing a whale who plays 50 plus VPIP, do you think it's the right adjustment to tighten your range in EP and use a larger sizing? Yeah, sure. Uh, that depends a bit on how it works, uh, 64 Diamonds. There's a bit more nuances to that, right? I mean, the stack size and the who's behind you and that type of stuff, but um, it's a good, uh, it's definitely a good start. I mean, I, uh, I've i played guys where I raise like 10x preflop every time, right? Obviously with a tight range. Yeah, you don't want to raise ace nine off another gun for 10 blinds and just get squeezed to death. But yeah, sure, that works. If an op opponent opens slightly tighter in the cutoff, for example, but doesn't fold to three bets, and, only, and four bets only strong hands, do we throw it more or less or the same? Um, well, the thing is, I mean, I can't, roughly the same, Shadow, because if you say he opens a bit less, that would mean you're, you want to be a bit tighter, right? But, well, so you're not going to have much success with a three bet, but since he's calling too wide, like he's opening too tight, but he's calling too wide, so it kind of evens out. So he's kind of going to the flop with the same range. So you probably want to defend a bit less because I mean, you just have worse odds to call, right? But when it comes to three batting, it's probably like, you know, roughly the same frequency. Uh, and then you're helped a little bit because if he doesn't four bet much, you just get to see more flops. With 0 0.1 anti big blind and NL10, we shouldn't be calling it uh, the big one super crazy because of rake. Um, you're kind of lucky um, that it was 0 0.1 BB tour.
because I mean, what they should have done, they should have just made the anti bigger to force everybody to call, and then they get the rake more. So yeah, if the rake's not that, if the anti's not that large, then calling extra hands is not as important, right? Of course, you need to call some extra hands, but for instance, uh, the games I play are usually with a zero point two big blind to anti. So with for us, the adjustment is far larger, and also we pay virtually no rake, so. Um, you know, we, we get to actually maximize that adjustment. So yeah, you would you would have to defend a bit wider uh, tour, but not that much. I mean, there's going to be 0 0.6 big blinds added, added to the pot in a six max game. Hey Sherlock, I'm a high six player. I'm running out of games. What's your nickname on the WPN net network? Where do I find fucking fun games? Waiting for 10 hours for 500 hands a night. <laughs> um, all right, so my my nickname on uh, on ACR is Double Leg TD. So I normally wouldn't tell you my nickname is anywhere, but I think everybody probably knows that because if every day after like 6 p.m. somebody takes the tables from Malta, right, and I have location Malta on Stars and Open Sit there as well, eventually, I mean, you don't need to be a genius to figure out who that is. Um, so yeah, that's my ACR nickname. Um, as for difference, I mean, as for different sites, I mean, you just have to go on all the sites that we're offering uh, below. So you can uh, you can sign up there, also get extra rake back, stuff like that. And uh, you have a good game. So just scroll down and we also can help you consult. So if you scroll down and you see the uh, the purple uh, picture of best deals and softer sites, that's where you can find some of the, the good ones. So yeah, your approach can definitely improve a little bit if you're not finding any games because there are games around. Um, yeah, you can't call. What should folded three bet look like when raising first in? Is it similar from all positions? Um, so we're kind of it's it's similar from all positions, but it's not the same. Uh, obviously, the I mean, uh, yeah, it's similar, but it's not uh, exactly the same. What should folded three bet look like? We should be folding very often, actually. Calling three bets out of position is generally a poor play. I mean, we can't we have to call three bets uh, sometimes. We can't avoid that. But calling three bets with a wide range out of position in a spot where it's very difficult to realize equity is uh, is very uh, is a very uh, dangerous spot to be in. So we end up what we end up doing is we end up doing a lot of folding, but we also fold about often. So calling a super wide range doesn't really work. What is a good time to get personal coaching? I just started playing 200 Zoom, winning at 4BB and almost 100K hands. And I feel very comfortable at the tables. I never got coaching. I just bought, bought your high six course. Thank you for that again. You're welcome, Taliko. What is a good price per hour in case I get coaching? Um, well, that also depends who you get coached by, right? So some guys may not be the best players, but they are really good at teaching theory. Some player, I mean, you might just get coached from somebody at the very top. So that really depends. But you can expect to be paying... Um, I mean, if you're already winning at 200 and you want to get coached by somebody significantly better, you're going to be spending many hundreds of dollars an hour. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we're offering the CFP is because, you know, it, it kind of sucks when you pay a lot of money up front and then, you know, maybe that takes a chunk out of your bankroll and then you can't play as confidently, right? Whereas with our bluff to spot coaching for profits uh, structure, you basically, we coach you mostly up front and then you play and then only once you've won, you pay money, right? So basically, you've already earned your money. You've already had a chance to then move up or like, you know, play more comfortably. Whereas if you pay up front, it kind of sucks. And also the coach is not as incentivized to do a good job. Now, I'd like to think that humans, that most humans at least try their best, but eventually people will not fully do their best, right? Because they're not, they know they have no reason to. Humans try and be as efficient as possible. So they, if they can accomplish the same with less effort, it is only natural to try and eventually uh, to eventually uh, do that, right? So, I mean, if you can do something easily and then with the le with less work, you can still accomplish it. People will automatically start doing that. So, whereas with coaching for profits, it's different because the more money you make, the more money that the coach makes, right? So he has all the incentive in the world, other than just not being an asshole, um, uh, to to do a good job. <clears throat> Let me have a sip. Location is Malta, yeah, stick to, stick to Joker. Do you sometimes get bored of poker during a session? Of course. Do you stop, stop or force yourself to play a bit longer? I have many times. I don't always enjoy playing. I mean, I usually enjoy playing, but not always for the whole duration, sure. 
<clears throat> if he opens much wider and standard doesn't focus three bets, then we three bet much wider. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by much, but yeah, sure. We can, you know, if, if your opponent plays more hands, you can play more hands. It's kind of that simple. What's up, three year IRU? Is it possible to get ABB per hundred nowadays? Um, that is a very steep win rate, but uh, in the right games with the right style, yeah, that works. Uh, a lot of our students have ABB win rate, actually. Obviously, they, they would have to play in very soft games, but we make sure they do. I mean, we don't force them to, but, uh, you know, we, we definitely say, like, hey, you have access to these games now. Uh, you know, we definitely recommend that you play there because, I mean, it's in everybody's interest for you to win as much money as possible, right? Especially your own in best interest. Is BBI sick the line is of New Jersey? <laughs> uh, wow, I did not know that BBI sick is sick the Joker. I did not know that. Uh, but yeah, it seems so. I mean, uh, BBI sick started with us. He was playing, I believe, 100 and 200. And last week he messaged me on WhatsApp. He's like, hey, yeah, I won 79K in, 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 this, uh, in this one session. Uh, I was like, wow, that's, uh, that's a big progress. Uh, you know, going from like, uh, you know, low stakes, low mid stakes to winning almost 80k per session or in a session that's uh, that's pretty sick but um i think he would claim he would claim to be the lions of new jersey sure but he also has an avatar of himself so you know take that with a grain of uh, grain of salt thank you for subscribing the the best what's the lowest stakes you take for the cfp um and it's either nl5 or nl10 phineas nl2 not yet but uh for sure nl10 so you don't need to be, listen, you don't need to be a superstar to join, right? I mean, we're here to coach you. If you play as well as Linus does, there's not that much to teach you anymore, right? So you, you, you don't, don't worry. If you say, hey, I'm, I'm winning, I've won one small, I'm not a crusher, that's okay, right? We'll, we'll try our best to make you one. In a high-rake environment, how wide would you call the button versus a small one three bet? Uh, find the call ace 10 off. Ace ten off is not the greatest hand because I mean your hand is very unplayable. Uh, it's a nice hand to some us for, but so but well you ask you should ask yourself more questions, Tor. Uh, what about the sizing, right? If he goes to twelve, that's different than him going to nine, right? What if you're two hundred big blinds deep? What if you're forty big blinds deep? What if your opponent sucks? What if your opponent is awesome, right? A lot of these things matter. In general, speaking of ace ten off, ace ten off is not the greatest hand to call through bet with. In position, out of position is obviously out of the question. How is it profitable for Bluff to Spot to take on NL5 players? Uh, well, that would be more like a business uh, talk, so I guess we don't need to get into that, Phineas. Uh, obviously, we would prefer to have guys who play bigger, right? There's more potential there, but uh, we try and be open to as many players as we can, while, of course, maintaining quality. You know, we're not uh, like some CFPs, we just want to get as many, like, get random guys off two plus two, stake them, coach them, and then most of them fail, but some of them get there. We don't want that. Right, we want to just have a limited amount of students and provide quality coaching. So, I mean, neither is superior. I mean, we believe our method is superior. I'm not shitting on the other method, but uh, we quality of coaching, like coaching quality, is is number one priority for us. <clears throat> no, and it's not a ten year contract fund, and we'll not send you to Malaysia where you have to work uh, in, a, in a nail salon like sewing footballs together or something. You don't have to do that. Don't worry about that. Arthur is not going to be streaming with us anymore, unfortunately, but uh, we definitely appreciate all the times he did. He was uh, he was active for a long time. So let me have a quick sip of water and then we get started. Uh, how many students do we have? Uh, right about 100, oh, no, no. And how many coaches? Uh, probably about a dozen. Uh, you can check them out on the Bluffs of Spot website. I obviously haven't counted them. Um, I'll link it to you. It's probably about 10. Obviously it's for different projects, right? So some guys coach lower, some coach, co coaches coach higher. So if you were to get coached for bluff to, with bluff to spot, it's not as if you get coached by 12 of the different guys, right? It's nice to get different perspectives, but you know, we don't want to have 12 people coach uh, one person. I don't, I don't think that's, um, I, I don't think that works. If you always get uh, news from different uh, for, uh, from different people. Yes, that is his name, Ugly, but uh, we'll be posting this on YouTube, guys. So subscribe to YouTube, our YouTube channel, please. Um, but obviously, we're going to edit that part out. So I should have renamed the footage. 
Uh, I should have kind of given it like a porn name or something to troll you guys or troll myself. But uh, we'll be editing that out. We don't want to, um, you know, ruin somebody's privacy, of course. So, uh, you know, I don't mind telling you guys we've got about 100 students. But if you ask me, hey, is this a guy's student? I'm obviously not going to confirm or deny that. You can ask him yourself. Okay, so let's review some more hands. I like the fact that the replayer is in the bottom right. <laughs> and now we're going to have to write another novel. It was a summer day, 1861, October 22nd, in downtown Manhattan. No, okay. Yeah, this, uh, I, as we talked about, uh, this is a bit uh, over the top. So we see this in, you know, we see an interesting strategy here. We see it a 3.5x raise, which is something you don't really see much anymore. We have to be very, very tight here. We're getting awful odds on a call, right? And obviously we're going to be paying rake. So we can three bet a decent amount against this strategy, assuming he's not a big net. Uh, but calling here, we can do it a wide range. So ace jack is normally going to be a combination of call and three bet. If you believe this guy is very loose, three betting makes more sense. If you believe this guy is very tight, Calling makes more sense. And we've got this like average flop. I mean, if you look at the timing and the funny sizes and whatever, this guy is probably a recreational player. Um, in theory, this hand is probably a call once on the flop, fold leader streets, unless we improve against this recreational player or presumed recreational. I would like to see you just fold right now. Um, you know, when you see, I, I see this a lot with recreational players. They like min raise 2.5, and all of a sudden they go like 3.5x, and they like pot the flop, pot the turn, pot the river. And it's unlikely that they think, well, I'm going to just take my 6.5 off soon and just pot it and make a stand now. It's most, most likely just them having a good hand, right, and just giving away uh, a tell with their size. So I would say if way, it's way more likely that they've now got a strong hand than that all of a sudden they, you know, just tilted and have nothing. So I'd like to see you just fold here. I wouldn't hate a call, right? As I said, if you were to sim this, the uh, pie would probably tell you to call. It might even tell you to raise occasionally, but uh, it's very important that you keep things simple, right? Against uh, somebody who could be weaker. Don't try and outplay yourself. So, I mean, this is kind of like a bittersweet, um, it's kind of a bittersweet turn. It is the best or second best card we can see. And we're still just, you know, potentially hopelessly behind, right? Because we could just be dead. We could just be drawn to a jack or an ace. Uh, we could have some reverse implied odds, right? On like the ace of clubs or like just on any ace in case he has ace queen or set. So yeah, and, and this is on one of the best cards in the, uh, in the deck, right? So he now bets half bot before he was betting bigger. So he's lo he, he's saying like, I didn't like this card so much, but I'm still comfortable betting enough. So it looks like he has a hand like king queen to me. I wouldn't hate if you called, but I think we probably should have gotten rid of our hand already. And now we're basically hoping that he checks and then he probably still beats us. So be careful. Don't get lured into these types of tactics. He Okay, so very important. Very important that you look. Okay, so he's got his knife. So that's very, that's huge information, right? Okay, so he raised the 3.5x with ace 9, which is whatever. I mean, his hand is obviously a button raise. And then, okay, he see bet on the flop, which is like reasonable. He bet the turn, which is reasonable. And also noteworthy that he didn't end up bluffing the river, right? So his ace of clubs is not particularly good to have. But then again, his 9 is obviously fantastic to have because he blocks 10-9. And also he blocks hands like queen 9, etc. So interesting. King 8 is normally very close between call and fold, or even four betting makes some sense. Um, however, you have to be a bit tighter here. So we see this player was playing 22 VPIP once again. So getting rid of your hand, I don't hate. And King Queen call, uh, calling is generally not the greatest option here. I don't, yeah, I think calling here is too loose. So we see Bill Ivy, <laughs> at least a sick nickname. But um, the thing is with King Queen offsuit, like you're very dominated. As, as in here, look. You flop top pair, second best kicker. You can't flop much better than this. And if he triple barrels, you're still uh, in an awful spot. So be careful calling three bets with too many of these like shitty offsuit hands. And especially with the high rake, especially against players who might not be that very aggressive. So 
So he thanks him. That's the third pot. Okay, we can assume these guys are regular. Obviously not going anywhere. I mean, if we're going to call preflop, we definitely want to... If we're going to call preflop, we definitely uh, want to see a flop like this. So we end up raising here. This is not a board on which you want to raise a ton. Um, I would probably say that... I would say for you, you probably get away with no raising at all. I mean, you do have sixes and sevens, right? And he doesn't hold, have them very often, but you're not going to have kings here, right? Uh, you're going to have six, seven, but he's going to have six, seven. He's going to have ace king. You're going to have some ace king. So yeah, we could go for some raises if you like, if I, if you like, but what I generally recommend uh, students uh, at around uh, low stakes is that they just call here. Right. Yes, there's definitely merits to raising the fact that he went with a really small bet on a, you know, somewhat dry, heavy board. It, it, there's some merits to it, but in general, I would say just um, uh, calling makes sense. If he ships, we're going to have to call it off, although we're definitely not loving it. So this is kind of one of the issues, right? Like, we're not going to have this ace very often. This ace, we have to check on a ton. He can obviously have ace-king. He can have aces here. He can have something like ace-check of clubs that improves. Um, so we have to be very careful. So we have to do a ton of checking behind. And I'd also like to see you check behind quite a few traps here. So we let's say we have a hand like ace-king and we raised it. You can check behind sometimes, right? You got sevens, check behind sometimes. So you kind of see, you know, it's very difficult to implement this raising strategy. A jack ten is in <laughs> very easy fold now. And on the river. Okay, so I would consider a valley bet, but I think checking is best. Also very interesting that Phil Ivy chose to trap his hand, right? I think it's fine. I think it's a fine trap sometimes. Okay, I don't hate it, but it's interesting. It's something that you wouldn't see the average player do. So I definitely take a mental note of that or just uh even an actual note, just like uh, tricky on the river with the nuts or something like that. Just something very simple, right? And no, uh, no love letters. So yeah, I think the call was a bit of a mistake pre-flop. I also think that uh, you don't really need to raise the flop. So we get this, we, also, we get sevens, we get eight, six, three, which is a really good flop for sevens, but not the greatest flop for your range. I'd like to see you size up a little bit here. Uh, this is a board which is very draw heavy, right? A lot of draws out there, over cards, whatever. So, yeah, we'd like to see you size up here. Betting range one third doesn't really work on this board. Sevens is a fine hand to bet one with. I mean, you could just write spazzing around on uh, with the ace nine. You don't even have to write anything too complicated. And we saw Peter now lead out. So let's go back a few seconds. So we get this five turn and now Peter leads out, which is kind of strange, right? Because you'd say that the five doesn't improve him that often. I mean, maybe he has an like four deuce. He could have an like seven, nine, although unlikely because we have a two sevens in our hands. So it's not a card in which he improves that significantly. I mean, I'm not sure if you open 7-9 suited pre-flop. I would assume you don't. I would assume he defends it. But I also think he's going to check raise a lot. So it's not as if he's got like a monster advantage now. So I don't really like this lead. But anyway, uh, we block top pair. Decent. Fine, I guess. We also block the nuts. We have some equity. So I would say this is a call. And now when he leads half pot here, it looks to me like he's saying, hey, I've got like a pretty decent value hand. Like I've got a hand like nines that didn't want to check raise, or maybe I have a hand like, you know, like four deuce or I have seven four or something like that. And, you know, I, I don't love this board pair. So I would, prob uh, I would probably end up folding, to be honest. I, I wouldn't hate a call. I mean, you do block the straight. The flush draw did miss. Ten nine did miss. He could, uh, of course, have some random hand. He could, of course, have some hand like six five. I think folding is probably best, but I wouldn't hate a call. What does he have? No, I didn't even see it. Uh, King Jack, I don't hate a call, but it is against 3x. I genuinely do not know what he had right there. Let's go back. 9. 
Is that a second line? Guys, quiz, what is that? Well, he won, right? So it's not 9-4, it's not 9-5. Um, it there's a curl, there's a little curl at the end, uh, in the bottom, so it's not a seven. So it has to be pocket nines, I assume. All right, pocket nines. Yeah. So I mean, that is one of the hints we predicted. Okay. I think it's pocket nines, right, guys? Uh, also, one thing I tell you, your your HUD is very very messy. Um, I mean, I can't even see his hand, right? And I've been trying for ten seconds now. So I would definitely say clean up your HUD a little bit, make it more precise, just add like turn it into one block because right now. You've got three huds, uh, three huds per player. So, and especially when you start mixing different size tables, it's just very, very messy. So, and that will tilt you in the long run, and it will just, uh, you know, hurt your productivity. Ace King will always be three bet in this spot at a hundred something big blinds. In five seven suited. Against the right guy, you could raise this, but limping by, like, overcalling makes sense. We're not going to overcall super wide because, I mean, the rake's high and you're out of position uh, three-way. But 5-7 suit is a nice and, you know, playable hand. So I'd like you to uh, to limp this, like, uh, V-bib this one. Yeah, I think that's a bit tight. I don't hate it. I think a lot of people call way too loose there. So if you have, like, king Deuce offsuit, easy fold. But 5-7, uh, I think we could have called And okay, you're making a you value bet King Jack, but I have no idea what happened. Okay, so if villain bets any meaningful amount, we're just folding the King Jack. And he le uh, he checks behind, and we get an eight turn. Uh, this is a great turn for you. You're going to have pocket eights, nine eights, seven eights, some six fives, some Jack tens. Uh, so I, I think we can lead out here somewhat aggressively. I don't like the sizing. It seems like uh, one of the mistakes you're making, I've seen it a few times now, is that you're using a lot of these half pot bets. Um, that I, I call that tournament syndrome. I Of course, I'm not trying to offend you, right? But it's kind of called tournament syndrome where... Uh, tournament players like they always like to bet re like they they don't really like checking because they're afraid of what's going to happen next. But they they never really bet big. So what happens is that when they have very strong ranges, they end up not getting any value. So I'd like to see you bet bigger here. If you're betting very polarized ranges, uh, you know these like middling bets don't make as much sense. I don't hate it on this board because it's quite the tricky board, right? But uh, yeah, I don't like the sizing too much. And on the river, we can do a couple of different things. I mean, we're going to have a lot of 10s here. We're going to have queen 10 even. We're also going to have some weaker value bets. So I wouldn't mind if you ended up betting third pot here. Uh, the only thing is you'll have to be consistent, right? So sometimes you might have to take a hand like jack 10 or whatever and also bet small, right? You can't just like, I bet say I bet small with third, with one pair and I bet, uh, you know, half pot with two pair or a set and I bet three quarters with a straight and I go all in if I have the super straight, right? You have to be a bit more deceptive than that and say, okay, most of the time when I bet my small, my hand's a bit weaker, but not always. Sometimes I'm just trapping with the with the nuts. So I don't hate the small bet. Checking also makes sense. Um, Ace 10 suited here. I wouldn't like this three bet too much. I mean, this, this player could be a recreational player. Uh, I especially don't like the sizing. I mean, 11 and a half is my sizing at 100 big blinds, but when you go so big when he's got 55, I mean, you're giving him such a great price on the shove. So, yeah, I'll definitely go ahead and three bet smaller if I did three bets, and I would usually call. Uh, you know, you want to play use your pull swap advantage against a recreational player here, potential. Yeah, I definitely like this call. So, guys, if stacks are less deep, you generally have to size down a little bit. Yeah, you're also wasting a lot of time with this type of stuff, right? Like timing out and whatever. So that's why I keep harping on it. And easy fold of ace 10. Uh, there's no decision here. I understand you could be ahead against king queen or something with a club, but you just can't really realize your equity. Ace king mostly gets called in this spot, actually. I wouldn't hate sometimes for betting. Uh, but again, we see here, we see 23, 17, you know, just somewhat nitty. Uh, I wouldn't go crazy for betting against these guys. So I would just end up for uh, calling most of the time. Don't hate the sizing. 
We're going to have to call it off, but we're definitely not loving it. And that's an awesome board for you. I mean, this hand happens to miss, but he doesn't really have anything on this board, right? He might have NI8-5 or 6-5, I guess. He might have like 8-7. Of course, he's going to have some overpairs, but the board itself doesn't really improve him. So we can just bet quite small here. The board's very dry. Perfectly fine with that bet size. We, we are obviously going to have aces and kings, etc. quite often. And those hands are just crushing this board. Pocket eights, perhaps he could have once in a blue moon, but yeah, you know, unlikely. And ace nine, I think we can end up just calling. And here with ace king, I mean, I'm sure this hand would get shoved sometimes, but uh, that would again be outplaying yourself when these guys just, you know, pretty quickly check raise here to a, and what seems to be a committing size. I think you have virtually no fold equity here, so I just like to see you fold. We, I mean, this is one of the weakest hands in our range now. Uh, as I said, if, if you put this in pie, I'm sure it would not fold sometimes. But remember, we're playing guys who are on the nidir side, right? We're seeing a 23-17 player who likely isn't just going to go crazy and check raise 10-9 suited, hoping to get uh, you to fold ace-king. Is it possible? Sure. Is it likely? No. We've got call mark, thank you in the game. Um, handles play fine. I mean, okay, so you're also taking notes on things that are relevant. I mean, you're just noting the fact that ha he has a check raise range, right? I mean, that's nothing special. King six is usually a call. Pocket eights, yeah. I mean, th that's one of the downsides of the entire high rate game, right? Is that we're just going to have to. Uh, Fold hands like pocket eights there sometimes. We get called when we are with the king six, and you know, this hand is not the worst for betting. I mean, you've got a king high flush draw, right? Um, it's a board on which, I mean, you could do many things. Uh, I would tend to mix it up here. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to bet their pot with your full range. Uh, that's a fine strategy, but uh, a more advanced strategy would be to, you know, maybe size up a bit, maybe have some checks in there. So, yeah, oh, okay, we might be betting half pot. You actually decide to check back. So even though this hand mostly gets checked uh, bet here, I actually like that the fact that you're being tricky here, right? This is something that I don't see a lot from um, um, players uh, at lower stakes is that they're not really very tricky. So on a turn like this, some crazy guy might just bomb it against you and then you just fold everything. So I don't I don't mind checking. I, I prefer betting usually, but I like the fact that you're being a bit deceptive. Because now we got the you know virtual nuts and he's not going to expect it. So it's kind of cool to be unpredictable, right? So he can't just go crazy and, you know, he, yeah, he's going to bet like this. And I'm like, oh, great, what, whatever, call. And so he'll put us on a one pair hand. And now he'll put us on like ace king with the king of diamonds or something. And he'll shove all in trying to get us. And we're going to snap him. And easy shove now. Take your time. Take your time. That would be too quick. Take your time. Right? Maybe because... If you're bluffing here, I mean, you want to think about it. Like, man, what are we bluffing? Like, even this is a bit on the quick side. Like, we got tens plus a diamond. Is that a, is that a call? Is that a shove? Is that a fold? All three options make a bit of sense, right? So give yourself some time. I mean, it's a very difficult spot to figure out. To figure that spot out, you probably need 10 minutes, to be honest. You, you might, yeah, you probably need 10, 15 minutes, actually, to figure out uh, exactly how to play this strategy. And you only have a few seconds. So at least take every second you can. At least with king six, it's uh, an easy decision. We're going to go all in. And so when he tanks here, it looks to me like he has a straight, maybe two pair. If he had a flush, I think he would have called already. Looks to me like he has a straight. Maybe ace jack. Pocket eights, maybe. Ace jack, okay. So he's thinking you were full of it there. Nice hand. All right, we'll do another hand and we look at some questions. Serious tempo today.
Be careful of the short stack and the big blind. Okay. Four or five is just a fold. This player is also not very loose. That, that's kind of a trend, as you see. There's not that many super aggressive players, even though we just got three bet. Uh, there's not many super aggressive players in here, so uh, generally we get to be a bit wider. Now, this four bet sizing is, uh, is, is far too large. We made it 27 against 10. Uh, something like 24 is plenty, so you don't need to go so large. So let's look at some questions. We lost one table. There we go. Through the magic of television. All right, guys, let me have another, another sip and then we answer some questions. What's going on with the PLO content? Um, you mean on YouTube or um, as a CFP, Shadow? So we also have a PLO CFP. You can find more information on the website. Uh, so we've had, we've actually acquired uh, quite a few students lately. So that's really taken off. It was going slowly in the beginning because, you know, in the beginning people don't really know your name yet and whatever, but it's going quite well now. And we've got a coach who is almost like way overqualified, right? Run Chucks. I mean, he's playing high stakes on a daily basis. So excellent coach. So if you want to check it out, just go, uh, just go on the website, uh, Shadow. Um, let me link it to you. Um, BD coaching. There we go. Um, that's it. I sent you a link. We'll run check run Chuck stream on Wednesday. Um, you'll have to ask him. So yeah, you'll have to ask him. I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm not aware of everybody's uh, streaming uh, dates. So funny that every coach has a selfie besides MMA with the dog. I mean, who do you want to see? Me or, or my dog? Come on. We both know we want to see the dog, right? So I'm just doing you guys a favor. Where is the female guest? What's up? It's my cool day. Um, he's talking about Mania. She, she entered the chat last time and said she wanted to be on stream. Um, I believe we actually contacted her. It's funny how I said the word Mania and all of a sudden we got two, t 10 new viewers. Uh, who are hopefully wearing pants. Guys, everybody wear pants. Only I get to wear no pants here. Um, and back to Mania. Um, we actually, we I believe we contacted her. We have not a response. In chat, she said she has to check whether or not she will be allowed to join us, right? Um, but we're going to make In case it's possible, we're going to make it happen. So I'll be joy she'll be joining the stream then. And uh, I'm sure she'll, you know, maybe she'll ask me to join hers. And I'll obviously happily return the favor. So, but um, nothing set in stone yet. I was hoping to get it done for today, but we didn't. We haven't heard anything yet, so it'll take some time. But we'll get it. Uh, we'll hopefully get it done because I don't think Party Poker are going to make a fuss out of it, given that we are uh, partners with Party Poker and we're making them a lot of money. Or, they're yeah, we're making them money for sure. What win rate would you expect someone to have at 100 NL if he beats 54 eight big blinds plus? Um, I mean, a lot of people just look at quick samples of them winning big and say that's my win rate, but whenever they then lose, they just ignore that. Uh, eight big blinds plus is possible at NL50 on stars, but again, it is difficult, right? So it is difficult. As I said, some of the students have that, but it's not easy. Um, I mean, so you're probably going to be paying a bit less rake, but you're also going to be losing. So if you're uh, losing some more to your opponents, right, or winning some less, so if you had eight big blinds, let's say you probably have like five or six, I would guess like five, let's say like five, but uh, those are ambitious number six for diamonds. And how many blinds should a player have for moving up? Um, the, you should just do it gradually, right? Just like play out a table, like just put some of this play like a random good game or whatever, just add a table here and there, and then you can be a bit more, uh, you can be a bit more uh, loose. Is there any woman playing 2550 plus? Um, well, back in the day, Mr. Y did. Sophia Lovegren played a little bit uh, a few times. I saw her uh, live playing uh, 2550. There's a few of those female regs in Vegas. They're kind of strange because like all of them are Asian. 
they're kind of strange, right? If you guys have ever rented a Bellagio during the WSOP, you'll probably smile and think like, yeah, he's right. Uh, what you see in the Bellagio is that there's like at every table, there's like one woman. She's always Asian. She's always around 30. She always speaks decent, but definitely not perfect English. And she's always like not that good, but also not that bad. All of them are the same. So they must be coached or staked by somebody, right? Like it, it doesn't make sense that all of them are kind of very similar, right? But they're just at all different stakes, all different games. It doesn't make any sense. So yeah, some of those play uh, play big. I, I've played the 100, 200 before. Lauren Roberts plays uh, big too, but I mean she's not a she's not a professional. What well, VPM and PFR would you consider not tight at these stakes? Um, well, not not an expert in everybody's VPM at NL50 necessarily, but I would say 24, 25 plus is not nitty. At high stakes, I would say 26 plus is not nitty. Do you agree with the call with Ace Jack with the diamond? Um, probably not. It's for a chopping 100 BB over a loose three barrier thing. In theory, yes, ugly, but we can devote the whole session to that. In theory, yes. Uh, I didn't say, hey, go do it all the time. I would say in general, avoid it. We said that before, but the 27 was too large. What sizing would you use? Uh, deep. Well, the thing is, happen there on, it wasn't deep, right? So we can go up to 30 if we like against 10, but uh, you know that wasn't the case here. Thanks for subscribing, Pato. Pato 7BB. Next year it's going to be Pato 10BB. Let's see. Yeah, 2.7 was too large. I think 2.4 is more than enough. 2.4, 2.5, maximum 25. Most people don't go to 10 there. Most people go to 9, and then I tend to go to 23. 24, then hey, maybe 25 against 10, but uh, not larger than that. At, at, at least at 100 something big points. Kirsten Big now. Okay. Actually, yesterday, oh no, two nights ago, I uh, I uh, I stacked Ben Affleck uh, at 5 on BCP. That was kind of uh, hilarious. Uh, he uh, he definitely needs to work on his game a little bit. He definitely plays like he's got 5k at the table, uh, you know, given that that guy's pretty rich. So yeah, I stacked him. It was pretty sweet. Uh, I've never played with. Uh, Kirsten Big now. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I went on a, a Ben Affleck rant. Uh, because I, I, I thought you were talking about that actress, Kirsten. So Kirsten Big now plays high six tournaments, right? I thought you meant that actress, the the the, the short blonde one. Kirsten Dunst, uh, that is. Uh, I confused the two. Anyway, yeah. But uh, Ben Affleck was playing two days ago, and that was like, yeah, it was not a special hand. It was like, uh, I opened Queens. He calls flops like Jack High with two two draws out there. He donks, I raise. He I he calls, turns to ten, bring a second flush draw. I shove for a little bit over pot. He didn't have a full stack. He called with ace queen suited with a flush draw, and I held. So nothing spectacular, but it was a fun game. Very uh, very active game for sure. And uh, you 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 might see a YouTube video about that uh, very shortly. Stake by the casino because fish like to play against women. Ah, uh, but they don't speak. They're not. In, they're not American. Those women because they speak with an accent. They're like from like you know Singapore, those countries where they speak good English, but they definitely have an accent, right? They're not like Chinese or something where they would speak no English almost. They they definitely have lived in America or like speak good English at least. But uh, yeah, I don't know what's up with them because they're all the same kind of. Uh, so there must be like somebody who is coaching them, staking them, whatever. Stake by casino. I mean, that actually sounds not like it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but not the craziest one I've ever heard. I guess it's possible. Uh, I could see a conflict of interest with that not even being legal. I, I I don't know. I guess it's not impossible, but I'm not sure why all of them would be Asian. Maybe so they're not American citizens, so they can pay them different. I don't know. I I honestly don't know. It would be fun to know the answer. But there's definitely something organized going on. That's not a coincidence. <clears throat> what is the minimum win rate you need to go uh, to the next limit? Um, I wouldn't look, I mean, I wouldn't say there's a minimum, at least like a few BB, right? It, I, I don't have like clear numbers on that, as does Do you think AGL underscore by could be a bot? Uh, no, definitely not. 
Definitely not. Uh, did you ever play against this actor from Spider-Man? Uh, oh, Tobey Maguire? No, I've never played. I, I, I haven't really played many people you guys might know. So... Obviously, I played this. I played this guy uh, Ben. I played him online, right? I didn't play him in real life. Actually, I do know that he plays poker. Um, there's a guy called. I mean, I'm not gonna say his name. He's also Asian American, and sometimes they go to his uh, apartment and they just play heads up, like Ben Affleck and him. So I was like, you lucky motherfucker. But they play much bigger than 5K. There's also a. It's a private game that goes on in New York. I mean, there's no way I could get into that, but uh, it's like it's the. What's the guy's name? Uh, Bruno Mars game, right? It's uh, it's sometimes like five, it's sometimes like one k, two k, but with like fifty k stack. So it's like all in every hand. But uh, that guy apparently is not that. That guy is not too bad, I heard. So it's not even a great of a game. Where were you playing? Uh, that was a WPN. How do you join the CFP? What are the requirements? Um, they're not like set in stone, right? But uh, mostly what we want to see from you is that obviously you put in a decent amount of volume, that you want to work hard. If you're just come to like fuck around a little bit, I'm sorry, but we'd rather have students who work hard, right? So mostly putting in good volume, being engaging, what be, being willing to learn, right? Uh, that is mostly the requirement. Is it like a minimum amount amount of things? Like, you know, I, I would say in general minimum, I believe it's 20K hands a month. Um, but obviously we can a bit be flexible, I guess, but we want guys who work hard. So if you're interested in that, what you should just do, uh, bro uh, brother fish is sign send us an application and, you know, we'll tell you what we expect from you. You can of course expect, tell us what you expect from, uh, from us. Right. And then maybe we can make it work. So, um, if you want to get coached, you should just go right here. Just click on apply now. You fill out an application, it takes a few minutes. Just tell us something about you and then uh, we can see if it works. When will this women lawyer come again? Uh, why do you want the women lawyer to come again to our cool day? Are you ever gonna do a hand review? Um, you mean chow. Are you ever gonna do a hand review? Yeah, sure. Or are you just nagging at me saying like, let's, uh, let's get the show on the road again. A few more questions and we get uh, we resume uh, the footage. BG. If you go full to MMA, how long do you need to prepare the Bellator? <laughs> I'm not a fighter. Uh, it's quite cool day. I'm not. Uh, I have no inspiration of being a professional fighter. What do you think about Mike Tyson's comeback? Um, I mean it's kind of fun, right? Because we we all like Mike Tyson. He's you know he still seems like he's pretty good, but he's 53 years old. He's probably pretty good at hitting the bag for a few minutes, but you know, when you're 50, nobody wants to see people at old fight. So also Mike is probably taking a decent amount of damage in his life. So you don't want to see a guy like that get hurt. So it's kind of fun to think about, of course. And would I watch a fight? Yes, but I'd rather see him not come back, you know, for just for his safety and his health. And that guy has plenty of money again. So he's got a big YouTube channel now. You should guys check that out. It's kind of fun, right? He has some good guests on. He sells a bunch of weed and I mean, it's Mike Tyson, right? Mike Tyson is a, a culture was a cultural icon, not as much as Muhammad Ali, but he he still is, right? So I mean, Mike Tyson, he could just go to a random university and speak on how to be successful, and they probably pay him 100k or something. Mike Tyson will always be able to get rich because he has such a big name. He's so famous that he will always he will find just like a random rich guy to give him money, most likely. So Mike Tyson doesn't need to do this for the money. So, you know, just stay safe, I guess. He, I mean, again, you're 53. And Mike is obviously an awesome fighter still. What is the closest airport to Playa? Um, I, I, I don't know. I just know that one. Do you feel safe? Uh, yeah, Playa is actually safe. Uh, my friend was robbed once, but it was actually by the police. And it's not like an, like an armed robbery, just like, hey, like, why are you drinking outside? Like, give me your wallet and see. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take this wallet and you can go. More like that, right? Uh, no, There's, the thing is, guys, the cartels own a lot of the resorts in Playa and around Playa, the, the shopping centers and all that type of stuff. So it's in their best interest to not see any violence happening because it's bad for tourism. So... No, there's a, there's very, very, very heavily armed police driving around there, uh, but kind of for nothing. Nothing happens there. 
you know, all the people I've asked, they've always said, like, I've never seen any issues. There, there's nothing going on. I mean, Mexico, very, parts of Mexico are very dangerous, but Playa, not really. If you go to, like, Sinaloa and those places, yeah, that's dangerous. I wouldn't want to go there. Especially, uh, especially not being uh, Mexican. What so Asian sites are available to Americans? Probably a lot of them, Chris. Mm -hmm. Watch this fight versus Buster Douglas. Well, I mean, that was kind of a shock, right? It was also kind of a fluke. I mean, it's not like, remember TJ Dillashaw against Hannah Barrow? Like, everybody expected Barrow to cr uh, crush him. He just got beat down over five rounds, right? That was not a, that was not a fluke. Kung Lee versus Scott Smith, that was a fluke. Gegard Mousasi versus Uriah Hall. That was a fluke. And flukes do exist. You know, some people say, say like, oh, uh, he tried to knock him out and he did. How is that luck? That is not true. Just because you try and do something doesn't mean you'll always be able to do it, right? I mean, why does T Tiger Woods, like when Tiger Woods hits, uh, hits the ball, he's always trying to get a hole in one, right? The first, hit, uh, first strike, but he rarely does. I mean, if there's no, if he, if he tried to get one and he did it, oh, there's no luck. Well, then why doesn't he always do it? Of course, there's a gigantic amount of luck involved. Luck is just the positive side of variance. And bad luck is the negative side. Luck just has a negative connotation. But there's luck all around us. The fact that nobody walks into your house right now and shoots you is luck. Obviously, it's just a tiny, tiny bit, right? I mean, some people, they grow 90 years old despite having a bad diet or a bad lifestyle. That's a lot of luck. Uh, there's luck everywhere. Sometimes you see in the football, right? You see somebody scores three goals in one, in like a, one half time, and then the next five matches he doesn't score any. So if he's always roughly as good, why is it doesn't he just score let's say one goal each each match? Why does he score three and then zero? Because there's a lot of luck involved, right? There's luck all around us. As I said, luck is the positive side of variance. So that's something you have to accept. But you can't just say luck does not exist. That is not true. And I've heard guys like even smart guys like Sebastian Vettel say that. And it, I just cringe and say, well, Sebastian, I'm a big fan of yours, but you're just flat out wrong. And that type of approach might actually, that type of thinking might really hurt your approach. In jiu-jitsu, there's no flukes. So how do people then sometimes win and sometimes lose? Right? Let's say, let's say. A matches you up against B and A wins. And let's say they match you get up again the next day, right? And the next day, obviously, they haven't changed their skills, really. How does B then win? It shouldn't be possible, right? I mean, if A is just better and there's no luck involved, he, he should just win the next day as well. Maybe not five years from now, but he should win the next day. How come all of a sudden he can lose now? Because there's luck, right? Maybe A wins 55% of the time, but he still loses 45% of the time. So him losing twice in a row happens nearly 25% of the time. Right? It's not as it's not so binary as in you're always gonna win or you're never gonna win. That doesn't work. It's usually somewhere in the middle. Anyway, enough uh, enough talk about uh, you know game th theory, I guess, or probability, whatever you want to call it. All right, guys, let's do some more hands. So we've got kings here, second best hand in poker, and you guys were asking for a female. Well, I assume that Hannah Hannah's man. Well, I guess Hannah's man is actually uh, a man, but uh, we got close. For a second, I thought, yeah, well, Hannah must be a, a female, right? I mean, in today's world, you never know. Maybe she's like a butterfly or something, but uh, traditionally, that would be considered female. And we three by the ace, king under the gun versus cutoff. And we get just, I mean, this is just the gin board, right? We've got aces and kings 100%. We've got ace king 100%. We can have ace five suited and ace queen and all types of good hands. So we can just murder him with aggression here. So going with a small range bet here is absolutely fine with me. Yeah, don't mind this. Uh, I would have gone slightly smaller with the three bet with kings, but if you believe that Hannah Hannah's man is a is not going to fold, then I don't mind. So yeah, now we got a few seconds and we saw that cryptic message and I don't think we're really going to uh, figure it out. Check, let me try and decipher this. Check back dong bets, dong bets, eight four of hearts on 10 four of hearts, ace, okay. So some kind of aggressive move, okay. So aggressive, okay, got it, aggressive. 
Oh, wow, running good. So we can actually check this back sometimes and trap, but if we bet, we don't need to go super big. Pot's already quite large. Yeah, I don't mind this. So in the beginning of the session, I thought you were maybe lacking a bit of deception, but I even if you decide to bet, which you did, at least you strongly considered it. A lot of guys would never consider even checking behind. So good play. It's pretty sweet that you're seeing a lot of these three X sizes because it's a really easy spot for it to fold. They're not really using the rake against you because it's so so it's such a clear fold already. King Jack easy open raise. We can forward him sometimes with King Jack here. We can also call. And 10-3 deuce is one of those boards that's pretty decent for for him, for him position, right? The 10 is good for both of you. The deuce and the 3 don't really matter. And then there's just some couple of draws out there, some over cards. So it's kind of a blank board. I am guessing you're going to range one third. That is a fine strategy, though though definitely not what Pi would suggest. Um, at lower stakes where people probably play a bit too fit or fold, that strategy makes a lot more sense. Uh, he should be going absolutely crazy with check uh, with raises there. Jack's easy raise and ace ten always fold never meaning calling would be a gigantic mistake. I don't think you're gonna call. And we've got check nine, which is a fine button open raise, and we see another donk by Mauricio here by by the big blind, and with jack nine having a medium kicker, I'm fine with just calling here. If we had a much better hand, I'd definitely like to see a raise. And this 10 is a bad, bad, bad card because 8 7 makes sense. 10 9, even 10 6, 10 8, 10 7. He could have even donked with a hand like Jack 10, Queen 10, and uh, hit a pair. So when he bets like uh, half pot here, he's saying, hey, I've got a medium hand again. Um, so it's kind of close. You know, when he has when he represents a medium hand, you could beat some of them. The problem is that when he has better than that, you're drawing really slow. So I'm pretty sure, given how I've seen you play, that you're going to call here. Yeah, okay. And now it's kind of ugly again, right? Where you, What I do see is that, yeah, you see this so much. A lot of these donk bets, half pot bets, a lot of medium-sized bets, it seems you're kind of getting, uh, you're looking too much at pot outs in these, play, in these spots and not enough at the players. Where, you know, you seem to be calling down. I bet you're, I, I, I think you're going to call this down, given how I've seen you play. And you're probably getting lured into too many calls here. Yeah. Okay, so so yeah, that's kind of a random hand. That would be one of the reasons why I end up calling here, because people can always have some kind of random funny hand, right? That is part, uh, definitely part of the, the analysis. Uh, but you are calling a lot against these, uh, these uh, you know, these leads and donks. I mean, how many times have we seen people lead out with some pretty good hands now? And how many times have we seen them out, lead out here with like, King four suited or something random. So be careful. You're 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 too stationy against small bets for sure. Especially when you see a lot of these weaker regulars or some recreationals go for these like face up plays. They're just value betting. It's very obvious. So if we're beating those value bets, yeah, sure, call right or even raise. But I'm not looking to call down super light here, right? That's a really a big difference between like lower and higher stakes. Is people are a little bit more face up with their strategies. They just they dunk when they got it, and then they check when they don't. That sounds really simple, but a lot of the time it's that easy. So make sure to read into that. Um, th seven three deuce is a great board for you. I mean, it's not a great board for you. It's just it's a great board for jacks, right? So we've got a hand which is quite valuable, needs quite a bit of protection as well. So I like to see that. We can kind of do anything we like on this board. We can expect fill board to have sevens sometimes, maybe threes and deuces. We can definitely expect the D, uh, D Jevil to have some of those. Five is obviously not a great card, but it's not the worst one ever. Probably like to see you bet again. And Jack Nine, yeah, so you see again here, right? You see the same thing. The five improves his range a decent amount, and now they're leading out. And Jack Nine, by the way, was a fold against 3x uh, with a high rake. 
So I would call here once. I think it's possible he's value betting more, so bluffing. But if he then bombs river, I would just fold. And so you're seeing, once again, these guys, when they have a good hand, they just lead out, right? It's one of the most obvious mistakes you can make in poker. One of the first things you learn is that generally donking doesn't make as much sense. And now, I mean, this card is super scary. He just quickly donked full pot. I mean, if he has 10-9 of, uh, of hearts, good for him, but I don't think so. All right, guys, we'll do a few more hands, um, and then we'll wrap it up. First, some questions, of course, and some explanations. All folds, nothing special. And that's fine, right? Even if you're, if you're, even if you're card dead for a few minutes, that's okay. Just play the hands you think are good to play with. Don't force yourself to play hands that... Uh, you know, just because you want to keep up some kind of arbitrary frequency. King's easy three bet. All right, let's make these the last two hands of the session. Ace queen suited, always three bet blind versus blind. Your opponent is going to open 40 plus percent of the time. Uh, I don't like this three bet size. It's way too much. If you believe that this opponent is like a big fish and he's just going doing stupid things like just calling king five off suit, yeah, sure, go ahead, make it as large as you want, but. I mean, this player has been playing 18-13 so far, right? That doesn't exactly scream spaz to me. So, yeah. Uh, it, this might be a standard sizing. No, actually, because you 3-bit king 6 to a smaller sizing. So, you I actually like the fact that you're adjusting, right? You're adjusting to something. You think this player has done something, but you don't have a note on him. The stats indicate he's tight. So, yeah, I don't like the sizing too much. I think just going 9 seems perfectly fine. And here with kings... Um, so I, I could tell you what to do in our preflop Bible, right? And mostly all in is the play. However, we have to consider the fact that these players might be much tighter than uh, than uh, your average regular. So I wouldn't hate if you ended up calling here. So let's look at him. This player seems to be nineteen playing 1917, right? That's kind of nitty. Uh, but it seems like this the, his 3-bet is 11. So he's probably pretty aggressive with, with raising. I wouldn't hate if you ended up shoving here, but uh, you would have to look at the statistics a little bit. You'd have to look at the, you know, the general uh, player pool. And yes, you can definitely run into aces here, obviously. Ah, that's not how we want to, you know, finish a session. All right, let's finish with a suck out. Oh, no. Ah. No chance. All right, guys. So that was the end of the, the review. I might do a part two to this uh, series because I know you guys love this uh, type of review, right? Because a lot of you guys are, in fact, playing ML50 and it's it's more, uh, you know, it's more relevant than me reviewing like four, two, 2K, 4K Triton, where, you know, a game that most of us will never be lucky enough to play. So, yeah, thanks to uh, our student for, uh, for submitting the footage. Uh, as I said, there's a couple of leaks. We'll be discussing um them in more detail in part two right but uh, i think he played very well he's definitely a winner in the game there's still a lot of improvements to be made but he's definitely on the right track so and the fact that he came to me and said do you want to review the footage showed us shows a certain amount of assertiveness that you need in uh, in poker as well as in business right if you wait for good things to happen to you uh you can wait until you're very old whereas in these in these types of industries you really have to make good things happen. So the fact that he came to me and said, like, do you want to review my footage? No, it's fine, but I'll take a yes. That that That's a good sign, right? Anyway, let's do a few more questions. Hey, MMA, I recently purchased a high six course and re re read a bow. Uh, I don't know what you mean by the last part, but I appreciate that. Uh, the, the fact that you bought it looks good, mate. Uh, does it actually look good according to like the the way your uh, like your uh, your your screen name suggests? What do you think? Be honest. The performance isn't always the same level. The variance is how good you fight on a given day. Performance is definitely. I mean, some people are more skilled when show don't show up. That is definitely uh, part of it, uh, Puba. But that's also that is also part of skill. What do you think about bomb pots? Um, I don't even know what they are. I've heard of the term, uh, but uh, I don't even know how they work. So 
I'm guessing it's something like a rate grab, but I don't know. There's definitely luck in BGJ. There's luck in virtually every single aspect of life. The fact that we exist, that we're talking to each other right now. I mean, again, luck is a positive side of variance, right? Variance is the, uh, is the, the base concept. Ah, okay, so you extended the question. I recently purchased the I6 course and read about the lab. I will try everything from the course and be shown walk down in the lab. Will uh, will everything from the course also be shown walk through in the lab? No, it's going to be different content. Looks looks good, mate. Otherwise, why would you ever purchase the lab, right? No, it's going to be different content. Of course, especially if you buy the lab plus, uh, which probably makes more sense for you since you're probably a more advanced player. Uh, it's going it's going to be more advanced content, but no, it's different. I mean, you can't just we can't just like make five pro like make one product and just give it five names, right? And just sell it five times. That's that's not very fair. So it's going to be different things altogether. Um, and for uh, in, in the lab, we have the basic lab, and the upgraded lab. The uh, basic lab is uh, the basic lab is obviously a bit more basic, as the name suggests. And the lab plus is a little bit more advanced. So, but if you are looking for advanced concept, advanced content, I definitely recommend it. And I would also like you to join the webinar, right? And that will be uh, obviously free if you are a lab member. So I think that's something uh, you would be looking for. Looks good, mate. Do you think there's any point in betting quarter pot in the ace king hand? Yeah, sure. Reason. Uh, that's not something that should keep you up at night. Uh, you know, betting thirty three percent pot versus twenty five. But yeah, sure. Every time I see video reviews, it is amazing how you how hot you guys run. <laughs> um, it is of course possible that the students only send me footage in which they were uh, win, right? Um, but I mean, we just lost that ace's hand, so uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is a random uh, piece of footage or if this was carefully selected. We'll never know. I tilt easily. Any tips? Um, playing with good bankroll management is uh, most important. Uh, obviously, playing games that you can win in, you know, in which you win quite a bit, so you don't have to tilt as much for losing because your win rate's higher. Uh, and just general experience in both poker and life will help you, Mike. I was like that as well when I was 18. You'll get over it eventually. You said you would have folded the Jack-9. I would have folded the Jack-9. I mean, even though we won, I would have folded. I didn't backtrack. And even if I did, that, that's fine. Sometimes people backtrack, right? Some people. Sometimes you change your mind, that's fine. But no, I do believe that we should have folded the Jack-9, even though we actually, I mean, I would have been wrong and... Uh, our hero would have been right. <clears throat> yeah, there's going to be a part two. Don't worry about that. Uh, perhaps not. I mean, it is Friday. Uh, Tuesday's stream will be canceled unless I tell you differently because I'll be uh, I'll be super jet lagged. It'll be way too early. So you'll be hearing about the updated schedule ASAP. And we're going to change it around a bit because Mexico is six hours behind Europe. Give some advice on playing with whales that are stations. Value bet them. Value bet the shit out of them. Don't bluff them too much. <laughs> Value bet the shit out of them. Don't bluff. I swear I hadn't read that comment, but good point, Kitchen Mafia. Well, I wouldn't say you can never bluff them, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't make a habit out of bluffing. I was wondering why in your bluff the spot group advanced uh, the answers from coaches are without their real name. Oh, because we just use their nicknames. So I mean, it's not, it's not. There's no uh, specific point. We just chose the nicknames, right? That's mostly what people are known for in poker. I mean, people, me, people don't know my real name, but they know my nickname, right? So it's easier to recognize who you're talking to. There's not some kind of hidden, you know, secret behind that. Marketing-wise, I find it irritating. Well, the thing is, if we were extremely famous, you would maybe want the, the, the real name to make it more personal. But I mean, you know, for instance, Jimmy DeRay is like, get, uh, his name has grown quite a bit, right? He's playing mid stakes and even some higher stakes, but not many people would know his real name. So people would be like, wait, who is this? But then they see his screen name and they say, hey, wait, I was railing Fiverr and Zoom in 1K the other day and I saw this guy, right? So it's more familiar. So yeah, once we're as, once we're as famous as like the BTS pop star band, from Korea, then we'll use our real names. Do you watch podcasts? Um, I watch some clips of the Joe Rogan podcast sometimes, but other than that, no, not really. I don't have time for that. 
Uh, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll download one because I'll have a ten and a half hour flight. But generally, no. I used to uh, when I was younger, long time ago. Jimmy answers his bluff the spot coach. Oh, um, sure. Uh, I mean, that's just something we'll have to change here, Spring. I mean, as I said, we're, we're still updating the lab, right? So we probably just named it Coach because we're doing other things that were more important, but we're going to call him Jimmy or whatever he prefers to be called. So don't worry about that. That's something we can change in five minutes. It's just that, you know, getting everything to work properly, uh, properly is priority, and then we'll, you know, make everything look even a bit nicer. How much did you pay for the business class ticket? I didn't prepare. I did not. I've never flown business in my entire life, honestly. Um, I bought, actually paid. It was really cheap. I, I got a direct flight from Amsterdam to Mexico City, and it was three hundred and eleven euros. And then I still have to pay for the uh, suitcase. So that's actually really good. But I know I'm I'm kind of a nit with money. I I can't spend one or two or three thousand dollars on a for a ten hour horrible experience. I mean, even if you sit business class, it's still a horrible experience, right? But then you just pay a bunch more money. So maybe when I retire, whatever, if I'm super rich or something, maybe, but I don't know. I And also, by the way, now, if you want to buy business, don't do it because you're going to have three seats for yourself in almost every row anyway, because nobody's flying. So you can basically lie down. The flights I choose, I usually have three or four seats to myself. So you just get a pillow and you have a business class seat or better, but then for free. Okay, guys, uh, that's it. It's been long enough. It's been over an hour and a half. Um... I'm going to wrap this one up. Tuesday stream will be canceled, but I'll be back on Friday and you'll hear about the schedule. Uh, most likely it will be at 6 p.m. again from now on, like it was when I was in Mexico uh, previously. So thanks for joining. Uh, thanks to the student for um, sharing the footage and we'll see you part two of it soon, okay? So stay, stay safe, guys. If you, uh, let me quickly plug YouTube because I know, I really like how our YouTube channel has looked lately. And by the way, we've only we've almost got 10k subscribers, right? We've got 9.2k subscribers, and I thank you for that. So we're gonna have a big 10k uh, subscriber video. It's gonna be a special topic, and also we're gonna do a giveaway and everything, as long as of course you're subscribed. So stay tuned for that. It's free shit, right? Nobody hates free shit. <laughs>